150 miles south of the Arctic Circle, a rugged expanse of Alaskan wilderness remains uniquely apart. Mount McKinley National Park. of the year, the sun has little to do with this particular corner of the world. At best, it can spare nothing more than an occasional glance. And so the land, though full of life, appears dormant, hard, brittle, and white. In the month of June, the sun begins to linger and then to pour its full attention upon the land, like a warm hand prodding the tundra into wakefulness. And in response, the pulse of life quickens and spreads through the park. The surge of movement and color is destined to be brief. The summer days are long, but summer itself is a race against the onrushing winter. The land and most of its animal occupants will have just three months to renew themselves and their species and to gather strength before winter again slows the pace of life. In this terrain, the threat of survival is thin indeed. With only bare minimums of the warmth and moisture which make life possible, the processes of survival are too spare to endure complications. Here they have been reduced to their most fundamental level. The plants provide food for some animals. Many of the plant-eating animals will become food for predators, and the predators themselves will ultimately nourish the soil and the plants. That is the simple formula for life in this corner of our world. It varies only with the happenstance of the seasons and with the strength and fortunes of the animals in their ceaseless quest for food.
Two things combine to make McKinley Park unique among the rare remaining wild places of the world. The first is the naked simplicity of its terrain and its life patterns. So freely does the eye travel from tundra to mountain peak to sky that one prolonged glance will cover the distance from creation to death. Moving scarcely a step, one can see a fragment of glacier ice, 10,000 years old, transformed to water. Witness the water seeping life into the roots of a willow. Observe a moose devouring the willow, and watch a grizzly bear add the moose flesh to his own. In few places is the full drama of survival enacted upon so wide and open a stage. The second ingredient of McKinley's unique value is that its elemental drama, in so nearly pure a form, may be witnessed by a human audience. Visitors enter deep into the park's interior over a single meandering road. With no branches or offshoots, it is intended less for travel than for observation. People may leave the road, but only on the same terms as the animals, on foot. And like the animals, their numbers are limited by the park's ability to absorb their presence without altering the routine of survival. On such terms, the park visitor may view the forces of nature much as they may have been seen by other men a thousand years ago. If he walks in the right direction, he may in fact reach that intriguing ground which has so lured men through the ages. He may actually step where no human foot has stepped before. The towering mountains and endless valleys of this wilderness, along with its giant inhabitants, inspire awe for their size and power. But the basic miracle of the park, the fundamental substance of its life, is to be found in a miniature world that reaches no higher than a few inches from the ground. This is the breadbasket of McKinley Park the stunted plants and shrubs which feed many birds and animals. And the miracle is this. Frozen in their growth for most of the year, with but a few precious weeks to absorb the life-giving rays of the sun, allotted but sparse amounts of moisture, and unprotected from howling winter winds which tear at their shallow roots, over 400 species of flowering plants are maintaining their livelihood. The entire structure of life in McKinley depends upon their continued success. To make the miracle possible, nature has provided this tiny world with a special climate of its own. The tundra serves as its own blanket of insulation, retaining enough of the sun's warmth to raise temperatures within the vegetation 20 to 30 degrees higher than they are a few inches above. And so the harsh battle for survival hangs not on the giants, but the dwarfs, the plants which hug the earth, absorbing its heat and evading the clutch of wrenching winds. The ultimate purpose is simple existence, but there is beauty here too, including flowers so tiny that a bouquet of their blossoms can decorate your thumbnail. squirrel 
animals hibernate in the tundra. But lemmings and other rodents continue to scurry about their business under the crusty roof of snow. Less than three dozen species of mammals have adapted to life in this land, and most of those species live their lives within this thin mantle of vegetation. Their livelihood comes easily compared to the endless efforts of the moose or the wolf in search of food, but still, no matter how easy or how small, each separate life must meet its purpose. And so the easy life is often a short one. Predators and prey alike pursue the constant search for food. The birds of prey and the berry eaters live their lives to the same end as the grizzly and the squirrel. Together with the mammals and the mountains and the tundra, their presence is woven deeply into the great pattern nature has fashioned. Many birds reside permanently in the McKinley area, but others migrate from points as distant as Asia, 
giving this self-sufficient wilderness its few ties to the world outside. A golden plover flies from Hawaii to lay its eggs in the tundra. Its eggs may feed a weasel, adding more life to the park. But an eagle from Montana will feed on weasels, allowing other plovers to hatch and return to Hawaii. And thus, even from so demanding a land, the web of life spreads outward in fine but traceable threads. The intricate structure of life in McKinley Park is clearly seen in the relationship between the caribou and its staple food, the lichen, a tiny rootless plant. The lichen is superbly adapted to the demands of the Arctic, able to lie dormant through the longest and most frigid winters. Then with the first touch of warmth and moisture, it begins to grow again. But its growth is glacially slow. A single plant requires as long as half a century to regenerate itself. And so the caribou, which thrive on lichen, could quickly destroy their food supply by overgrazing. With that brute instinct, so akin to true wisdom, the caribou never pause long enough to deplete McKinley's store of plant growth. They travel ceaselessly, eating on the move, simply passing through the park as they range over vast areas of the Alaskan interior. visits, some caribou become food for other residents, such as the grizzlies and the wolves. The final result is survival. Survival for the slow-growing lichen plant, the ever-moving caribou, the resourceful wolf packs, and the massive grizzly. Nature's life-giving compromise between time, space, cunning, and power. and reproducing their species are not always visible to human onlookers. Their movements are guided only by an instinct to live. On occasion, their quest for survival may bring them within sight of the road, but they are there only in spite of it, drawn by hunger or suspicion, by pursuit or by flight. To see them at such times is to catch a rare glimpse of a constant pattern of life.
there are days, many days, even in summer, when the clouds seem to descend and absorb the world. The great mountain ranges fade into vapor and the dimensions of the valleys dissolve into mist. Yet a great sense of magnitude remains, a magnitude no longer seen by the eye, but felt now in the marrow of the bone. On such days in particular, the visitor may sense an overwhelming characteristic of McKinley Park. It is the feeling that time, which obsesses so much of our lives, has had little to do with this place. And the fact is that only a few inches of plant growth separates this land from the days of creation. Crushing forces within the earth created these awesome mountains. The valleys were formed by the immense grinding weight of the ice age. No one can say how many hundreds or thousands of years elapsed before the first seed, perhaps carried by an animal or a bird, managed to take root in a patch of dust. And when the first plant died, its decomposition in this frozen and dry terrain must have required yet another vast succession of seasons. The mind can scarcely grasp a hint of how many random seeds may have struggled and failed. How many fragile plants must have decomposed over the centuries in order to clothe McKinley Park with its first thin colonies of soil and growth. Even now, the sharp heel of a boot may dig into permafrost, a layer of ground that has remained permanently frozen since the days of the glaciers. Yet nature persisted, and today, during the brief summer months, the veneer of plant life can brush the very horizon with its color and sweep, stretching beyond the grasp of the eye, back to the bedrocks of time. lies the great lesson to be gained from Mount McKinley National Park. If man will remain content here to watch and to listen, managing his own presence without trying to manage nature, he may find some assurance for his most bothersome doubt. He may learn that when nature is permitted to have her own way, life is inevitable.